we should throw that live. Okay, I think we're, I think we're doing it. I think we're out there, Ian. I think the people are looking at us. Hello. <laughs> How crazy is that? Hello, everybody. I'm Evan Abrams. Welcome to Motion Design Hotline. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is where we are going to try to answer your After Effects motion design troubles. I am joined usually by Kyle Hamrick, but he's away today. We have we have replacement Kyle. We've replaced Kyle with Ian Robinson. Uh, Ian, thank you for defeating Kyle in single combat to earn <laughs> this position. I know it wasn't easy, but that's It was how... a tough battle. It was a tough battle for sure. Well, that's the process here on Motion Design Hotline. You know, two designers enter, one leaves. That's uh, that's what we say. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Ian and his various works, he is a two-time Adobe Max Master <laughs> Trainer. Say that several times fast. Um, uh, and you may know his voice when you open up various Adobe help tutorials. But Ian, for those who don't know you, who, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so um, my name is Ian Robinson, obviously. Uh, I'm an art director slash creative director slash motion designer. Um, I do a lot of training. Uh, as Evan had mentioned, you probably recognize some of my voice from uh, when you first launch After Effects in the tutorials that actually pop up. I do a lot of those tutorials for Adobe. Um, a lot of you might recognize me from the After Effects Essential training on lynda.com or LinkedIn Learning. Um, and then I'm also co-owner of my own uh, training site with Nick Haraz called Creative 111, where we specialize in uh, creating training in a balanced approach for uh, motion graphics and video editing. So, yeah, and then, of course, you know, in my copious amounts of free time, uh, I, I definitely do uh, motion graphics projects as well still, uh, because before I really got super heavy into training, I was uh, an art director at Discovery Channel and worked in broadcast motion graphics in the D.C. area for over 15 years. So, uh, yeah, I've had works air kind of all over the place. So, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. That's well, hey, it. yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. So everybody who's hanging out with us in the chat, uh, please get at us with your questions, with your quandaries. Uh, pretty much everyone who's here are the people who couldn't go to Blend, Blend going on in Vancouver right now. And also, before we get the show underway, I uh, just want to say that this program is brought to us by Millinote, which is a, a wonderful suite of pre-production tools, which we use to make this show and get our lives organized. So more about that later. First, Ian, we gotta we gotta jump into an opening opening question. We usually do a kickoff question on here, and this time, you know, we touched on this in in people are watching this program religiously or often. You'll know that we talked As a little bit. About, that's yeah. right. Make this appointment viewing. Set it on your PVRs. Put put a thing in your calendar. Actually, just subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications because then you'll know. Please, please, yeah. <laughs> please. Uh, but. <laughs> We're going to be talking about camera motion. We're going to be talking about parallax. And specifically, you've got some interesting examples of, you know, how to breathe life into still photos, right, that are usually pretty, pretty lame. So I think we'll, let's, let's jump in with that, uh, you know, off the jump. Let's see, uh, let's see what you've got to show us. We're going to, we're going to jump onto, onto your screen presently and uh, see what's up. Yep. Um is it is it on? It, I'm it, not even it, it, that's right. That's right. It's on right now. <laughs> so the problem, right. Ian, is that we don't have a tally light for the top of your machine. Yes, yes. I'm the guy looking at the wrong camera, still going full steam ahead. So don't worry. <laughs> is this my camera? Um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, uh, I, I actually just uh, I'm in the final stages of uh, finishing a course, which we'll be releasing on uh, creative111.com. And uh, it's all about actually different methods for animating stills. Uh, and thankfully, we have some pretty cool um, files to work with. Uh, these are actual project files and uh, assets from uh, My Father and the Man in Black, which is a documentary you can find on the iTunes store. And uh, what we did is I, I tried to look at all the different um, still animations and things like that and choose 
common ones that most people will have to do at one time or another during their career. So here, I'll just scrub through my timeline here because I have some renders. So uh, this is one where basically we're just doing a pull quote where we pull a section of text out from the background, which may not seem like a big deal, but when you actually see the original uh, teletype uh, little piece of paper here that uh, came in. It had all kinds of pen notes all over it and things. Um, so we had to remove everything, clean it up, and then make the text pop. Um, another one here is just this uh, larger room where we built this overall composite from multiple images uh, and cut things up and had them offset in Z-space. Um, this is a typical newspaper animation move, but rather than just moving on the newspaper itself, we're going from one treatment of the image to another treatment of the image, which is kind of fun. And then this is probably what most people think of when they think of the parallax effect, where you've got multiple elements in uh, Z space and a camera move actually happening. In this one, we tweaked it a little bit more than what you might expect. We're using the puppet pin tool to actually distort his guitar a little bit. And uh, we added a lens flare over top of the fretboard here to uh, just add a little bit more interest into the move. And then uh, lastly, just another newspaper move. But this one was a little more fun because we integrated the parallax effect into one of the images in the newspaper. Hmm. So, yeah. So what, yeah, let's, can we go, go back to the, uh, to the Johnny Cash at the microphone one? I want to ask you some yeah. questions about this real quick. So Shoot, man. when we're talking about parallax, everybody out there, we, we're talking about the difference between background, foreground elements, and we can understand depth by basically the movement of things between them. So on this, we've got that curtain layer, we've got the mic layer, and then this, the, the person there, how many planes, like, have you broken him into? Like, is his... Is he all one plane or is the guitar a separate plane? Because I'm seeing like change between his yeah. hands and stuff, foreground bits. So what's all going on in there? So let me break let me break this down. Yeah. Um, his guitar and his arm up to his elbow uh, are on one plane. Now we had to recreate the edge of his elbow here because in the original image, it was actually cropped here on this edge. So we had to recreate this edge of the guitar and the edge of his elbow. Um, and so this is all on one plane. And then the strap for the guitar is also on that same plane. So it's all kind of uh, brought out in that one little area. Hmm. So you can see he actually kind of rocks the guitar a little bit back towards himself here. Um, and that's using the puppet pin tool to add a little bit more distortion to that. Another little fun thing that's in here is his face is actually on a separate plane. So his ear here and his face, but not this ear, only this year, all right? So uh, they're offset in Z space, and it's just a very, very subtle difference. But uh, when you actually do that, it adds just a little bit more depth um, to his head, which was interesting. And then the microphone's on a separate plane, and to accentuate that, we really move the microphone uh, a far distance. And then you mentioned the curtains. What's cool about the curtains is we actually generated those from scratch using generators inside of After Effects. Hmm. Um, so they're not even the actual curtains from the shot. We just added them behind. Um, and then another little detail that's in here that uh, you may notice now that I pointed out, but if you look in the curtains here, you can see there's actual noise over top of the image. Hmm. And just the fact that that's on a different plane from the background image, um, it just adds yet another level of depth when you actually do this animation. So, you know, in the documentary, this could pop up for you know, three to five seconds or 10 seconds or whatever. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into it to really kind of help each of these different elements pop. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought up the amount of time that we're looking at an image, right? So <laughs> I don't, I don't edit a lot of things anymore, but my earlier job, uh, like one of my first gigs was here, I'll, I'll put us back at the two shots so we can look at each other at least virtually. Nice. Uh, so what if, <laughs> what if my earlier, earlier jobs was working for uh, national defense, doing a lot of news and archival things. So it's a lot of like, here's some world war one photos. Here's some world war two photos. And if you stare at a still photo for three seconds, it feels like 10 seconds. <laughs> like totally. 
it's painful for people. And I know, I know Nick does a lot of things in Premiere and he talks a lot about your, your business partner, Nick, who talks yep. about a lot of editing concepts and stuff. Um, and you know, a lot of this is, is at creative One Eleven as well, but this idea that, that the audience's perception of time is kind of defined by movement, right? Like if it's a lot of shots, a lot of tight shots together, there's a lot of movement in the shots. It feels like it's going a lot faster. So, you know, adding this kind of movement is going to increase the the interest level in the thing, you know, and it's, I don't know, it, it's just interesting because when you don't have a lot of material to work with, which is where we were usually at, it's like, well, yeah. we have, we got three photos in 15 seconds. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. So, yep. you know, this is the kind of cutting things up, moving them around and, and making basically stretching your ingredients a little bit further, which is great. So anyway, so that, that that's good stuff for sharing. We actually have a, 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 a question here from uh, Andrew who is asking about animating from stills. And he's asking about how this compares to cinemagraphs, you know, that, that fun trend of having your high resolution photos. And then we're going to add in some kind of motion, some kind of thing in there. Do you do any cinemagraphs in your, in your time, Ian? Uh, I have done a couple just for fun, just to sort of see what it was. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of dovetail into each other, but cinemagraphs are, are honestly most of the time created using a separate application that specifies um, or, or that's specifically created to create cinemagraphs. Mm. Um, but what's cool about these techniques is if you learn these techniques, you, you can actually create an animation base inside of After Effects and then take the whole thing into the cinemagraph application and then highlight the areas that you want to flow. Mm -hmm. So for example, like in a cinemagraph application, you'd have a photograph and in the photograph, let's say there's a running stream right. that you may have shot and it just had some um, rather ambiguous textures that, that are just not very detailed. With the Cinemagraph applications, you can specify those individual textures and then tell it to loop those textures or, you know, there are a couple different presets that they do. Hmm. And uh, it looks at that stuff and then creates that. Whereas if you wanted to create something like that inside of After Effects, um, you probably want to make use of how to... Um, how to make loopable elements and different things like that. So you could make like high-end cinemagraphs <laughs> if you use these techniques uh, in, in After Effects. Yeah, so like when we're talking about looping things, this is sort of where you kind of have to take, <laughs> we usually take like the start and the end and then you bump them by half and then you blend one into the other. It, it really depends on the element you're looping, right? A lot of the times yeah. I've seen in a lot of cinemagraphs where they basically recreate the element they want to be moving. So let's say it's like a running running water, right? They would take yeah. the water, they remove it, they put in digital water that can yeah. be looped because it's simulated. Because a simulated fractal based water can be, you know, can be easily looped. Whereas real footage of water, I feel like you always see the seams. I feel, or maybe that's because I'm way too picky. I don't know. I was. Uh, <laughs> I can't I can't watch a lot of television anymore because you know you know my you know my, yes. my my significant other my wife is is trying to enjoy this wonderful charming story and I'm like can you believe can you believe this stuff and uh, how how does how are the dynamics of being hauled around by fairy wings supposed to be working on this person anyway we watched carnival row last night and uh no more episodes of that uh will be watched in this house as a team so oh nice nice i love the program i thought a lot of the cg elements were interesting but i had a lot of sure i had a lot of gripes about how things were moving um but that's you know that, it's a fantasy i have to give it up it's a fantasy show it's not <laughs> it doesn't have that's... to be <laughs> Yeah. I was going to say that happens to me all the time. If there's a bad edit or something, I'll be watching it and I'll be enthralled in the story. And then there's this like jarring edit and I'll just go like, gah! <laughs> and my wife will be like, oh yeah, sorry. That was a really bad edit. It really bothered me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you, what are you freaking out about? Did something happen? No. <laughs> I just saw I just saw two people's eye line didn't line up and it hurt me. <laughs> Point on the edit where it hurt you, Ian. Um, yeah, so, exactly. So and then Andrew, Andrew has a follow up actually before we before we transition out of uh, out of this onto onto something I'd like to show about parallax. Um, he's asking if you would recommend using a cinemagraph 
uh, app in lieu of After Effects or Photoshop. Like, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't touch a lot of cinemagraphs because people do not ask me to do them. But because I'm so comfortable in After Effects, I, w- I probably wouldn't leave it, you know? So so this might be uh, one of those moments where I ask if we could maybe just throw up a link a little bit later in uh, the, the channel. Oh, that's true. Um, yeah, just because um, I know I've used a couple, but much like you, it's it's been a little bit. <laughs> it's been a little bit, so I, I want to make sure that uh, what I recommend is pertinent. Yeah. So, for those of you who are watching this live, we have like a show notes page after this goes up, where you can see like a lot of the links and anything we reference. We go back and we try to backfill so that you can quickly find what you, what you're looking for. So that's just a. That's just a subtle plug for coming back to this, watching it later, and getting all the links. Um, but oh, would, Evan, Evan, yeah. Also, um, do you want me to show any like loopable backgrounds or anything like that, like loop, loopable Ooh. generators and that sort of stuff? I tell you what, you you cue that up where I, I'm going to okay. blah 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 about parallax a little bit a little bit more. So yeah, if you want to cue I that can. up, I'm gonna I'm gonna give my screen a share over here just so we can nice. talk a little bit more about parallax while we're here because I've seen. Some people in the chat saying they do parallax a lot for their work, so I figured I would, I would talk a little bit about different different movement that we can cause we can cause with the parallax. So here's a bunch of weird spheres, and they're really just out here so you can see what's happening. So you can see that we're moving through this space, but I'm not using a camera at all. I'm not even I'm, I haven't even created a camera. You can. If you want to make parallax, you can just take things, offset them in Z space, and shift a camera. That's literally doing the thing. That's um, that's Z space for people in America. Sorry, Z space. <laughs> what is <laughs> what is this man talking about? Z space. That's Sorry. where the Ian, That's where the evil Lord Zed and I guess his wife Rita Repulsa live. Um, <laughs> anyway, nineties only ninety kids nineties kids get that. Um, right. So. So when we're talking about parallax, we're talking about the movement of foreground and background elements. So if you have a look here at these three little nulls that I've put out in the world, and I've glommed a bunch of these spheres onto those nulls. So these foreground spheres are stuck on this null, which is translating the most. It's It has the furthest distance. And then the next one has the middle people and then the back people. So... The ones in the back are translating the least, and that provides this illusion of movement. Now I'm saying illusion because really these things are all flat on top of each other. This is this is fakery. Now, why would we do one way and not the other way? That's kind of the big question, right? Why would we not just do this using a 3D camera? Well, one of the reasons is because this allows you to be divorced from things that are real or true right? That if you have to simulate something, you can't art direct it as abstractly. I love playing in the abstract. I love when things are unreal or they have just enough realism for you to believe this kind of wacky thing. And that's kind of the idea that if you're art directing this stuff and you're keyframing it all manually, you have intense control. So I could decide, uh, this isn't quite where I want things. So I'm just going to rearrange objects a little bit touch up my framing a bit and oh you know what this whole this whole mess over here i'll just adjust that a little bit so i'm able to individually tweak these little pieces i can push them out of reality but you don't really notice no one's going to notice how unreal this is up to a certain point the big caveat when doing things in a two-dimensional way is just to make sure that all of your curves are the same all of your motion curves are aligned and their influence handles are all pretty much the same because that's the speed at which we need to be consistently moving for the illusion to hold together. So in this first run, we're just moving from side to side. And then in the second one, we're orbiting. So we're doing, we're going to do a bit of an orbit. So when the foreground Ooh. and the background, yeah, they move in separate directions. Whoa, I love what's that. happening? So yeah. this, this idea of an orbit It's an unreal orbit. I would have had to have had the camera, you know, stick it to a null and then twist it. But there's no guarantee I'm going to end up where I want to be, right? So that's why the orbit, by pushing the nulls in opposite directions, so the ones in the foreground are going 
to the left or the right. And you can kind of see them back there. This fellow's going one way and the ones in the front are going the opposite way. And it creates this illusion that we're kind of orbiting around a point kind of in between those back two nulls. So this is very helpful when you are sort of going from one MoGraph scene to another, or when you are, you are just transitioning from elements, you can do these kinds of cut on motion, cut on action kind of moves, where during the highest acceleration, you're switching to something. And if foreground and background elements are moving at the same speed as you go in and out, that can create a very compelling kind of edit. So that's just something to think about. And you can combine the types of movement. So we orbit and then we slide and then we orbit back, right? And you, you know, we don't have to pay too much attention to the reality of the situation. The other thing that how we show parallax is by uh, pushing the camera forward and backward. Um, this is where you're going to find out that it's Friday and I'm very tired because I can't remember if that's called a truck or not. Um, but <laughs> it's, 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 Ian, is it a dolly? Is it a truck? Dolly. Dolly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Forward, backward, dolly. Yeah. That's right. Everything's a pan, Ian. Just pan, pan forward, pan backward, pan up, pan down. Uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> everything is a pan uh, so that's that's something you can also do by scaling these nulls so by scaling them up and down not uniformly you know in in sort of differently then you can you have the the moving forward and backward feeling as opposed to the zooming feeling where you're just scaling up the whole comp this is adding another layer of depth to your movement through a scene. So that's something to think about is, is just separating things onto different planes and then scaling them up at slightly different ratios to each other, slightly. That's my <laughs> intonation for slightly. <laughs> and you can also combine both forms of movement. You know, This would be, oh, we're just gonna move that camera around an obstacle here. It's gonna do a little, little head fake, some bob and weave here as it moves in and out. I don't know. this. Now that I'm looking back at my example, this is way more biological than I intended it to look. But uh, you know what? That's fine. That's all fine. The final <laughs> thing that I want to talk about before we uh, move on to other biz is that because this is all driven by keyframe data, you can set up expressions that are relative to that keyframe data. Um, and you could even set up the movement of all these nulls to be relative to each other, if that makes sense. So... The idea here is that, you know, we're just pushing things around in, in the space. And uh, what we're going to, what we're going to see is that this wave, you see this little wave thing back there. I've set up just a little wave warp and I've linked its phase uh, to be linked to what's going on with the background most null. And so that phase is reacting to the change in that, uh, in that null, you know, at a ratio. And we're just saying, you know what, however much that thing is changing away from its baseline, then divide that by 10. And that's how much phase you're going to be doing. So it, it's kind of like setting up this deep background element that seems to be somehow related to what's going on. And you can easily set that stuff up. Um, so with that being said, Ian, we're going to go back to the two shot real quick. Uh, um, okay. cause we're like, you know, hey, just a warning. You're on camera now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is this is when yeah, the red. I stepped back. Yeah. <laughs> the red light has gone on the camera. Uh, this is the point of the program where uh, we take a brief moment to thank the sponsor of the program. Uh, I want to thank Millinote for putting this on and for setting us up and uh, for allowing us to bring on excellent guests like Ian and uh, you know just to uh, keep the technology going, even if I mess up using it from time to time. Uh, but. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Millinote is a pre-production uh, suite of tools. So, you know, this is where I go back to my screen and I show off what those things actually are. So yeah, right man. now, I'm I'm actually using it to collect all of the questions that we're getting for this show. But primarily, we use it in the pre-production process to collect things like mood boards and, and grab things and clip them from all around the internets and fill out your mood boards. You can throw video in there. You can get big old text blocks so you can remind yourself of your creative direction and then pull cool things from around the internet. One of the features I really enjoy uh, about this is that you can grab like color chips. So if you just put in hash and then 
the hex value. You get these cool little color chips that you can play around with. I find this super useful for communicating with, let's say, non-designer types when we need to decide on a color palette. And I'm trying to talk about, you know, ratios of color and when we see color on top of other color. This is how we would physically deal with swatches if we were doing like a painting project. Um, then you're able to do this in real time. You can share the board with people and you can push these ideas around with each other. Uh, Kyle and I knocked out the look of this streaming thing, all of the branded elements in about half an hour with this board. And we are in totally different parts of the world and we were able to physically touch the same desk. So it was yeah, it's super cool. It was very helpful. So yeah, uh, that's it for my plugs. Uh, this is where uh, Ian, I ask if you have anything as the guest on the show, what do you, what, do you, what would you like to plug while you're here? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, let me see about pulling those up. Hold <laughs> on one second. All right. So uh, yeah, as I had uh, mentioned earlier, I'm a co-owner of Creative 111. So if you were interested in some of that Johnny Cash stuff, um, please go to creative111.com and uh, check things out. That course will be out within the next uh, few weeks here. And actually, we have a follow-up course um, for that with uh, some more advanced techniques that uh, Kyle is going to be doing. So, um, you know, if you want to stay on top of that, definitely uh, check out creative111.com. And then um, we also do YouTube as well. Now, we are a little bit uh, newer to the YouTube platform, so uh, we're working hard to continually propagate that uh, content. Uh, updates every Monday and Wednesday, although I have to admit we've been a little remiss uh, lately, but that's um, that's due to the fact that I'm uh, really trying to get this course out. But uh, that will not happen in the future. We're going to be uh, getting back on top of that uh, as well. So if you go to YouTube and then just search Creative 111, all spelled out, O-N-E 111, um, not finger 11, but uh, 111, <laughs> you'll end up with, uh, there we go, uh, our stuff there. And then, uh, of course, if you want to see me live, uh, I highly recommend coming to Keyframes Conference. It's going to be in November 15th to 17th in good old Boston, Massachusetts. And I'll be there with uh, some other amazingly talented folks like Aron Stern and uh, Thanasis and um, uh, Mikey Borup and uh, Kyle, of course, and Chris Converse and Lisa Winters. You get the general idea. So... Yeah, that's uh, kind of what I'm working on. Oh, yes, I'm going to be at Adobe Max again. So if you haven't uh, got your stuff squared away with Adobe Max, definitely check that out as well. Yeah, Adobe Max is a great time. I'm always way too busy during that time of the year. But, you know, get if you can go, definitely go. It's Everyone I've talked to is incredibly inspired by what goes on out there. So it's definitely something to check out. So with that said, all right, we've, we've done our plugs. We've talked about parallax Ian, you said you had uh, some generators you might want to uh drop on us is that uh let's jump into that and i'll just tell everybody in the chat hey give us your questions we got we got ian here for you know i've i've uh you know locked him in his office for the <laughs> for the, that's right going for, nowhere. for at least the next half hour so any any of your after effects woes you you drop them on us and we're gonna solve them I, All right. Or I promise we'll at least try. So, so yes, we, exactly. So we got your screen up there. What do you got going on? All right. So what I've got going on is really exciting. It is a blue or it is a purple solid. I can't even read Ooh. colors. Um, yeah, it's it's a purple solid. So I'll go ahead and just select that. Um, I'm sure you guys know how to create solids. Uh, but uh, it didn't matter what color I created it because I'm going to be creating a generator which is going to override any of the color settings. So I went down, I'm going to go to Effect and Generate. And uh, rather than generating like a fractal, one of the ones I like to work with is Cell Pattern. So I remember when I was first starting with After Effects, I looked at this and I was like, why? Like, <laughs> <laughs> What would I ever use this for? What is the purpose and of this? Yes, it took me a little while to kind of figure out that, that this is just a baseline of something that you can actually um, stretch and distort and kind of really have fun with. So um, I'll start at the top here for my cell pattern. I'll click on the drop down and you can see we have uh, bubbles or crystals or plates. 
Now we had talked a little bit about water, so I'm going to recreate like the uh, the look uh, from the bottom of a pool, and I'll do that using the bubbles section here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I know it doesn't really look like anything right now, <laughs> but uh, I'm just, getting just very I'm yeah. getting very nervous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So here, I'm going to go ahead and increase the size of this so it's a little bit larger. And then it still looks kind of funky, but if I enable invert, now all of a sudden, I hope you can kind of see a little bit more how this looks a little bit more like light refracting in the bottom of a pool. Getting closer. Uh, yeah. So here I can go to my color correction and I can add a tint on top of that. And here I could uh, change the black to uh, some kind of blue. And then I could change the white to some kind of, uh, you know, uh, yellowish tinted color, what have you. So obviously that blue is a little too dark and saturated. So we'll go ahead and uh, do something like that. And of course I could add a blur on top of this or whatever, but I want to show you how we can actually make this loopable. But do you, do you have like a base idea as to how I'm making it look a little bit like the bottom of a pool? Is we're, that okay? We're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. All right. Well, I, I don't want to jump down that rabbit hole. I, I definitely want to focus on the, uh, focus on the, um, the loopable element of this. Okay. So in order to animate this, I have an evolution setting down here. So if I click the rightmost evolution setting and I scrub on it, which is something that I recommend everyone do. If you don't ever know what a parameter does, just scrub on it and you'll get a nice preview here. So I'll start it at zero and I'll make sure my current time indicator is at zero and I'll just add a keyframe for the evolution. And then I'll select my layer and press the U key so I can see any animated properties, which shows me that one keyframe I just created. So I'm going to move to the end of the timeline by pressing end on my keyboard. And I'll go ahead and I'll say, I want this to have gone through uh, three full evolutions. And you'll notice now if I press the space bar here, it's uh, going to go ahead and load. And my computer's uh, very happy with me right now because <laughs> I'm streaming and doing all this other stuff. But uh, let's get those frames cached. And you'll notice uh, while it does create kind of a funky looking animation, um, it's not loopable at all in its default settings. So I'll just press the space bar to stop playback here because there are options uh, called evolution options. So if I open that, I can cycle my evolution, and then I'm going to use J and K to navigate between my two keyframes. And notice, whether I'm at the beginning of my timeline or the end of my timeline, now they're perfectly exactly the same. So if I want this to be loopable, what I'm going to do is take this last keyframe, and I'll just move it one frame down the timeline like so. And then I'll press the space bar, and once those frames go ahead and cache, thank goodness I only made this comp five seconds, um, it's going to go ahead and show you that this animation is, in fact, actually loopable. So now it's completely seamless. So if you wanted to put something like this behind anything else that you're working on, you could do that. Yeah, and I, so that's probably like one of the critical parts of the loop is that one frame bump that, like, I think a yep. lot a lot of people miss the one frame. <laughs> yes, and and it it may not be something that you notice at first, but when you do this on a regular basis or when you watch somebody else's loopable elements, you'll definitely start to notice, oh, they've got one frame repeating. Mm -hmm. It's it's really kind of a little a little tiny thing and it's very minute. I'd say 90% of the people out there would never notice. But um yeah, it's good. Yeah. And it, so I'll say this. Yeah. That there's, there's often, <laughs> it's either one frame too many or one frame too few. Right. And, yeah. oh, it, it just takes a, it's a little bit of QA. If you're doing loops, do that little bit of QA. <laughs> that's all we can, that's all we can really say. All right. Oh, yeah. 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 For sure. So let's, let's jump back into the two shot here. And, yeah, man. And folks, give, send, send us your cues. Give me them cues. I've got a couple of them in here that we can uh, we can dive into. Sweet. So we've got uh, Love Needs V BTS. Does that mean behind the scenes maybe? Um, they say they want to start an animation channel but can't afford a graphic tablet. Do we have 
sort of any advice. Now, uh, personally, I have a I have a Wacom over here that gathers quite a bit of dust um, that I use primarily for rotoscope work, right? And it's the sort of thing where, in that instance, that tool was kind of essential to doing that kind of work at the time, right? Because this was. I want to say seven years ago, we didn't have any roto brushes and stuff. So in that way, the hardware was kind of required to prevent me from getting terrible carpal tunnel syndrome <laughs> for my hands, right? Right. Um, but it's it's interesting. You don't do a lot of animation, Ian. I don't think. I don't think you're you're not doing a lot of frame by frames animations of things. Uh, well, I mean, I definitely do a ton of animation, but not traditional frame by frame animation. Mm. No, so. Like like traditional cell style animation, yeah. no. Most but, of it is all After Effects stuff. But I think I think no matter what you're doing, we run into this question of I can't afford X thing, right? Yes. So I can't do that thing, you know. And like that's kind of the same thing. Like, well, I can't get a 4K camera, so how am I going to make short film, <laughs> right? Right. Right. You know, like you know, talk talk to me a little bit about like where do you fall in this idea of like. How do you bootstrap your hardware to do the thing you're passionate about, I guess? Yeah, it's it's really hard because this is when it this is when like your art and your passion sort of collides with um, where you are in terms of finances and mm -hmm. and what you actually have time for. I mean, uh, for anyone that's asking this question, I don't know what their personal situation is. So uh, I hate to say, you know, well, go out there and just do X, Y, Z like. Regardless of your situation, I would hope that maybe uh, you have some sort of employment structure to where you could maybe take 10% of whatever you make or even 5% of whatever you make, even if it's like five bucks a week instead of going to get a latte or whatever else. Um, just put it aside until you can actually get whatever it is that you that you actually need. Mm -hmm. um, and, and look at the refreshed equipment. Yes. Um, you know, that's a that's a huge thing. When I was in college, I used to buy refreshed equipment all the time. Um, if you're not familiar with the term refresh, um, I, I used to work at Apple. So that's a common Apple yeah. term. And, and uh, basically like, using the specific Apple terminology, we usually <laughs> just say used. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, basically it means somebody's uh, bought the computer, used it for a little while, maybe they leased it. So it's a, a year to two years old, sometimes even three. Um, and the company, whether it's Apple or Dell or HP or whatever, has taken it back and they put it through its paces and replaced any of the parts that actually are worn out or uh, too beat. And then you can go ahead and use that. Um, and then, of course, just checking all your local reseller boards. Yes. It's, it's really amazing. I mean, not specifically eBay. I have nothing against eBay. But, like, well, I find when you do local things, since this is, uh, it, as much as it's an awesome industry, um, it, it is niche in the sense that it's it's not something that, you know, hundreds of millions of people are doing. So somebody might buy something, take a class, and then, just want to sell whatever that individual thing is. So if you go on like a local board, you have a better chance of finding something that somebody's like 20 bucks. I just need it out of my house. Then, oh, yeah. uh, you know, a national international site. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this, like in terms of technology in general, like every few years, the newest thing is coming out, the newest fancy totally. thing. Right. So like this year, the black magic pocket six K camera is out. Right. Heck yeah. And beautiful piece of technology. But if you ever wanted a 4K camera, those things just flooded the used market, right? <laughs> because yep. people people who need to be on that latest thing are now going to jettison the second newest thing, uh, which is pretty great. And in talking about graphical tablets specifically, um, I picked up when I first was like, Am I am I even going to use a graphical tablet? Is this good? I got one of their four, the ones that are like for children, like their bamboo kind of. Heck yeah, the bamboo is awesome. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. It doesn't have it has it at the time. It had like eighty points of pressure sensitivity, whatever. It didn't have tilt or you know all those things. It didn't have all the features, but it was enough that I could say, you know what, for eighty bucks, is this technology going to actually help me? <laughs> right, and I was able to figure out, yeah, yeah, it kind of works. I could. And there's kind of a learning jump, I'm going to say, when you have a new way of interfacing with your with your machine. So totally. 
I went from the first time I ever edited, I used a trackball interface. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with these. Uh, yeah. This is where you're going to find out how old Evan and Ian are. <laughs> that... <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's got this, it had this trackball surrounded by a jog wheel. You know, this is this is the the old time like Apple II maybe kind of situation back when they thought you know what we we can just take this ball you just roll that golden tea ball around and <laughs> then you can totally that's how you move your mouse tea. but the jog wheel was so good for scrubbing through video and stuff and that made perfect sense so then when I had to transition oh let's use a mouse to do this. <laughs> And if you can imagine, why is that so confusing? Use a mouse for everything. But in this specific way, I didn't. And then again, it's another jump to say, oh, let's use a pen instead of a mouse. Whoa, you're going to have like a month, depending on how often you're using it and stuff, you're going to have that month of hardship. where It's like, why did I spend $5,000 on a tablet? I hate this, you know, and... When we're talking about graphics tablets, there's the ones you draw on the screen, and then there's the ones that you just the the Cintiq versus the the Intuos, I guess, lines. But I will say that Wacom's dominance of the market is being severely challenged by a lot of companies with a lot lower cost uh, boards coming in that are just as good and maybe have fewer driver issues. <laughs> um, yeah. That, yeah. That, something anyone who has one. So this is why I was like. You know, trying to trying to test if you had any specific woes, uh, Ian, with this because anyone anyone who has a, a Wacom Wacom tablet every six months is losing their beans because the drivers update. There's a mismatch, something bad happens, and suddenly the thing you rely on as your interface for the thing you do is broken. Now it it don't work now, so it's it's a challenge, especially whenever you're going to upgrade, but. When it comes to pursuing your passions and you're you're gonna try to bootstrap something, you know, look for people who are jettisoning jettisoning old stuff. Um, oh yeah. Or, you know, it, it's this, the kind of thing where you want to find find out how to get the best thing you can cheaply, um, and you know, you're not gonna have the shiniest thing off the rack. You know, when I when I. <laughs> When I uh, tried to learn how to skateboard, I didn't go out and buy the latest and greatest skateboard. I bought a piece of crap because I knew I was going to break it. You yeah, know, sure. That's the that's kind of the the lesson. By the way, still can't skateboard. Um, but yeah, that's <laughs> that's where I'm at with that. So, people in the chat, we're we're with you here for for you know another another twenty another twenty minutes here on the board. So if you have troubles, um, you know, you let us know. Let us know your trubs, and we're going to try to get to them. So we've got uh, actually one that came in. Really quick, where uh, Mivs Devs, I'm so bad at pronouncing names. I'm I'm immediately sorry for when I attempt to pronounce everyone's names. Ian, I couldn't pronounce your name earlier in the sound check, and you have a name that is similar to mine, uh, in that it is you know we, we both have the beige plate of names. So anyway, so he's asking, is modeling better with a graphic tablet? And you know we talked a little bit about various interface types. Um, it really depends, right? Do you do any 3D work, Ian? Are you, are you working with 3Ds? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I work in the cinema 4Ds of the 3D stuff. <laughs> yes. It is It is very good. I'm not only 3D, I'm 4D. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> it's so many Ds. <laughs> so yeah. many. He's got an extra yeah. one. Now, <laughs> so do you, you don't, but you don't use a graphic tablet when you're in the 4Ds, even in that fourth dimension. Yes. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But honestly, I, I have to be... Totally honest. When mm -hmm. I was working regularly, uh, where 98% of my work was in the post-production world, I, I had a, a big Wacom tablet that I did the majority of my work on. Right. Uh, it didn't matter if I was in uh, 2D or 3D, because um, you can you can map the controls to different things uh, within Cinema 4D. Um, so yeah, I, I would actually do that. But honestly, um, since I've been on 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 the circuit, so to speak, uh, doing a lot of instruction. Um, when you're in a lab with a hundred computers and they don't all have that, you need to be just as comfortable using a trackpad or using mm -hmm. a mouse. So I've become rather, um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I could care less what my input device is uh, right, just right. because I'm always having to work on a different computer at any given time. Mm -hmm. um, so no, but, I do want to tell you there are if you if you're really into 3D and you're really into 3D modeling and say you get into something like um, 
like ZBrush, where you're actually modeling as though it were a piece of clay and you're like pushing and pulling individual elements. There are actual three dimensional pens that have an arm that attach and they actually give you tactile response to your model. So when you're pushing on the edge of whatever it is you're modeling, you can actually feel the pen push whatever that model is. It's, it's <laughs> kind of, yeah, it's like where VR and, uh, and, and real life intersect. Yeah. And what's, what's really cool with that is you can even poke through the material and then you can pull the the stuff out so if you're taking like a traditional sculpting class right. and you're used to working with those different things they've really tried to make it like that now those are a little more expensive it's a little just bit. a little bit yeah well it's interesting <laughs> like this idea of interface right and yeah we're seeing way more vr way more ar things coming up totally. right and you know the question of is modeling better with a graphics tablet if you interface better with that, yes. I've found personally the things that are an allegory to using a pen work better. The things that are not an allegory to using a pen, not so much, right? It's like, you know, if I'm doing trying to simulate brush strokes, yes, the thing that accurately one-to-one -one does it is good. Um, but for most of my work, no, definitely not. Um, but... You know the idea of when is it when is it good when is it not good? We were having this this discussion. There was a company, uh, there's a company in Waterloo called Pallet. Um, I don't know if anyone's out there familiar. They make um, they make these things. This is a bank of arcade buttons that you can plug in and map to different things. Um, they've since changed their name to Mont. Monogram, I think. Monocle? You know what? Don't quote me on that. Uh, we'll put a link in the in the description later. But they've changed their input devices to better reflect how people actually interface with things. They're constantly trying to figure out how to interface with the stuff. And, you know, this question of which interface is best is very subjective. And what's going to be right for me is not necessarily going to be right for you. So that's something to, to really think about. And it's worth figuring out how you do, and you can only really do that through experience. Um, let's see, what else have we got going on? Uh, Ian, people are asking where they can find more of your work at, so, you know, where where can folks uh, uh, Google up and see some of your some of your past doings? Yeah, so um, since I did a lot of stuff for broadcast, I mm. don't really have that much that... Um, you need to go to like the up, early 2000s. Real. Yeah. yeah, yeah, go, go to, uh, to discovery.com. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah, I don't have much other than what you could see on LinkedIn Learning or Lynda.com. Yeah. Um, I have over 30 training titles on there, and a lot of those titles have uh, some graphics examples of stuff that I've done. Um, and then if you come see me at any of the live conferences, I can uh, share a fair amount of uh, that stuff as well. But um, yeah, as far as a lot of the different projects, Due to the fact that I've embedded video that, you know, some super high end DP has, I may not necessarily uh, uh, have the rights to actually reshare a fair amount of that stuff, which is a little bit of a battle. But um, yeah, it's a yeah. it's a it's a bummer often. Uh, let's see what else we got. We got uh, Nick Canton is asking if I'll be in Ottawa for the Ottawa Animation Fest. Well, I live here. So, yep, uh, <laughs> definitely. Nice. Actually, there's, there's actually a bunch of. Um, Folks getting together, motion graphics people getting together during the Ottawa Animation Fest. Um, so come on down to the Earl of Sussex in the Byward Market Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So, Sweet. So, Nick, Earl of Sussex, 7 o'clock Thursday night. <laughs> uh, so o Ottawa has this... So we talked about Blend is going on in Vancouver right now. There's various things throughout the world. Um, and, you know, this Ottawa Animation Fest is kind of a big deal. It's international animation coming to our nation's capital here in Ottawa. We don't have a lot of big cultural things, I'll say. We got Jazz Fest, we got Blues Fest, whatever, but like people are not coming here. We don't have, we are not a stop on the uh, 3D motion world tour. We are, there is no IBC here, you know. This is, it's very artistic animation. We have uh, an amazing animation program here at Algonquin College. 
We are one of the best places if you are an animation studio. We have a massive hub of traditional animation talent here. Uh, we have, I think, four animation studios now here. They're doing projects for Nickelodeon, Disney, all these things. So Ottawa is kind of a sleeper hit for animation talent and work. So, you know, it's definitely something to think about. You know, people don't think about Ottawa, uh, which is a bummer because <laughs> they should. I think about Ottawa. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, of course. When you're thinking well, of, of somewhere, course, you're there. So but, why wouldn't I? Think that's about right, Mr. <laughs> Evan Abrams. Come on. Outside of the context of me. You know? <laughs> okay, so let's let's get to some of these other questions. We've got some building up here. We might we might uh, run a bit long, maybe Ian, if you've got time. I don't want to uh, don't want to hold you over, but uh, sure, we've... man, I'm game. Okay, sweet. We're we're going long, folks. So yeah. Um, Ian, we've, we talked a little bit about expressions, you and I, beforehand, but uh, Caesar, uh, Caesar is asking, um, what are some of the best ways to learn code? I know that you don't code a lot, Ian, so what are some, this is why I want to ask you, if you ask me what are, the, what are the best ways to learn how to code, you know what I would say? I would say, it's, I would say it's so easy to do, <laughs> you know, but because you're someone who also struggles with this thing, so when you're trying to do expressions or any kind of coding where do you where do you go for help like what what's your process in this honestly uh, i go to the godfather of expressions uh mr dan dan eberts if Always. you will <laughs> yeah uh motionscript.com um i definitely go there and and check out a bunch of the stuff that he's got going on and then of course i'm just always out and about scouring the youtubes and the interwebs mm. uh for anything else that might be uh going on there as well but uh well, it's interesting. yeah i mean dan eberts is 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 definitely someone that has has built a massive foundation there especially yeah. if you're trying to get started um it's a great way to get started and if you're like me who you know, there's only so much room in your brain for everything. Uh, and sometimes just adding coding could be a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah. Um, it, it's a great way to actually find the expression, copy it, paste it, drop it into whatever it is that you're actually doing and uh, learn the basics of how to manipulate the expressions and read what's going on within the expression, not necessarily write it from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, Kyle. Obviously, Kyle is a great resource um, for all that stuff. So pretty much any time he comes out with something new, I'm, I'm trying to check out whatever, uh, whatever he's got going on with that. Yeah. The big thing to remember is that expressions are literally just a language. It's like learning any language. You have to use it, play with it, and have uh, kind of a feedback loop on your usage of it. So when you're writing an expression, tweak all the variables and see what happens. When you are trying to use a word, use it in different, like a use a, I said word, it should be like an object or a function, use it in different contexts outside of the one way you might use it. Um, so for example, a lot of people use the linear expression to just remap values. Well, did you know you can also use it to drive animation, right? So these kinds of little, little twists. The interesting thing is that most people get into this because they are visual people. They have, they have a visual learning style. So when we're talking about the best learning method, it may be something that uh, that requires a more visual approach. That's actually, that's something that I try to do on my YouTube channel where I try to explain coding concepts using visual metaphor so that we can like get them. <laughs> it's yeah. And it's hard. Like it, it's literally learning an abstract way of interfacing with a machine that doesn't necessarily want to interface with you. <laughs> if that makes sense, it would, it's a little bit like trying to learn French by going into the heart of Montreal and just yelling things from your, your dictionary at people. You will not get the best response. <laughs> you, will, you will learn to quickly give up and go back to speaking English. Um, it's a little little Canadianism for people out there. All right, we got so we've got we got like three three. We got a couple of business questions in here actually. Uh, oh sweet! Ian. So let's Ian. We have to put on our business uh, business faces now. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so let me just do up my one button to symbolize that we are now in business mode. That's right. So, I should have worn a polo. Sorry, sorry. Okay. There well, we go. You know. <laughs> so we've got uh, we've got Zach H. He's saying this is a freelancer question. Uh, would you folks have any suggestions on how to pivot 
from a longtime client. I feel like I need uh, to change and seek new clients. What is a nice way to move on? What's well, interesting, Zach? So, is the idea that you have a lot of a lot of short term people and you want to get more long term work out of folks? I guess kind of clarify for us in the chat. Um, you know what the specific situation is, and we'll and we'll come back to you, Zach. But uh, well, well, oh, you've already, you've already got thought. you've already got thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, my my brain. A million miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, all the time. yeah, here we go. So, yeah. Uh, the greatest thing you can do, especially for uh, past clients, is especially if you're trying to pivot to a different client or just away from working with them, is to give them another solution. So um, if you are working with any other designers or have any friends that are looking for more extra work, um, I would just recommend uh, working with those with those other folks. Um, that is assuming uh, this is a client that you've had a good relationship with and you definitely want to pass along. Uh, if, if it's a, a bad thing, maybe find your arch enemy and recommend them. I, I, I don't know, but <laughs> basically rather than just, rather than just kicking them to the curb, it's, it's always polite to uh, try and find, you know, someone else that you can recommend and just say, you know, Hey, I've been looking, uh, I've been looking at expanding my business in this other direction and it doesn't really fit quite with uh, what we've been doing, but you know, I have this other great resource. So I highly recommend what it is that they're doing. Mm. Um, that always makes the, makes the transition a little bit easier. Yeah. And it's, and it's an interesting question. Like how do I find clients who have long-term engagement needs, right? Most of my clients. So they kind of break into two groups, I'll say. I have direct-to-client services, which are, I'm a startup company and I need an explainer video, right? Oh, that's great. Yep. Well, good. Now we do that one explainer video and we'll probably never see each other again, right? Because how many explainer videos do you need? Probably one, right? Right. But sometimes it's a client services thought about, you kind of have to put on your, your marketing and strategy hat a little bit. You need to talk a little bit about audience. You need to talk about, well, we're going to do one video that you're trying to speak to everybody. Maybe we could make three that talk to your specific three customer bases. And that's an idea of expanding the project into three different specific shorter areas. The other thing is to try to convince people that, hey, we're creating one project. We're creating this one explainer video. Should we also make maybe 10 snackable little little bits for your content marketing situation you know it's very in vogue for brands to have an instagram a twitter populated with content etc so pitching people on that kind of a strategy now granted not everybody's in a position to pitch on strategy right that's not a thing everyone wants to hear i just wanted an explainer video why are you telling me to do something else you know but those are the kinds of conversations you kind of have to be willing to have if you want to convert someone's way of thinking from a one and done to an ongoing relationship with them you have to find other areas where your skill set meshes with what they need for their ongoing strategy and marketing and etc um now, that being said, not every client is right for that. So other than direct to client, another idea is maybe you should be working for production companies and agencies who have consistent labor requirements. So an agency is consistently staffing up because they have new clients all the time. But your client is the agency. So you will be interfacing with their freelancer pool, their HR people, their art directors and such over there because they have a constant need to staff up based on things that are happening. It's interesting, I have a lot of long-standing relationships with production companies who, it started off, they're like, well, we do traditional video work, this is outside of our wheelhouse, Evan, can you help us out? And wouldn't you know it, on the strength of those videos, they keep getting more motion work, we keep doing more things together, and it, it elevates their team. We've won a few, a few local awards uh, for them, which is pretty nice. Um, and that kind of elevating idea that now you've got someone else interfacing with the end client. So, you know, that's, that's kind of an idea. But the other thing is that, yeah, if you have, if you have toxic clients, then 
what are you going to do? You know, it's only so much abuse a human should absorb in their lifestyle. Uh, it's none. You should absorb none abuse in your lifestyle. Yes, but, none whatsoever. Life's yeah. too short. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 rough, but, you know, there's other uh, other fish in the sea. So hopefully that helps Zach. He's saying he, he's uh, <laughs> it's going to help him out. So let's see. what What's this other uh, business question we have here? Um, what do you suggest to charge? So this is uh, Ronty, uh, Ronty Deb is asking, what do you suggest to charge for motion design work? In my region, client pays in seconds basis versus charging on a project basis. Ooh, ooh. what's a good... That sounds brutal. (laughs) Yeah, so we talked a little bit about traditional animation, and traditional animation is generally billed at the finished second, I think. Okay. Um, And when you work at an animation studio, you're usually paid on a frame quota, for example. Like, this week you need to have 500 frames done. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good number. My literally, my neighbor on the other side of the wall I'm looking at is is a professional animator. They work at one of the shops here. I guess I could yell at them very loud and and find out. But they're at work right now, so I can't. But I think when you have a when you have a frame quota, right? That's an interesting kind of time pressure to be under, and it's a very different way of getting paid. The hard thing is how do you pivot from one mode of pricing to another? You know, that's that's hard if the expect if someone's already coming at you with this expectation. Have you ever dealt with this kind of thing, Ian? Yeah, um, I've I've not with this specific instance, but I've hmm. definitely dealt with, you know, they have a different idea in terms of what they're used to paying versus what I'm used to charging. Hmm. Um, and I'm not talking about like I want to charge 10 grand and they want to pay two. I'm just talking about, you know, they have a different idea in terms of how the charging should be taking place. For example, like short or long, uh, whether it's by the hour or by the project. And, and honestly, um, one, of the, one of the folks I highly recommend you check out is uh, Chris Doe, who is another uh, amazing speaker. He has a lot of things to say about what to charge. Um, I guess the, the hardest thing is just to try and whenever you're charging something, you want to show value in whatever it is that, that you're charging. And as long as people understand the value behind what it is, um, then you're usually golden. Mm -hmm. But if they don't really understand that value, then it's your job to educate them as to that value. Uh, one of the examples that, that Chris has, which I'm hoping I'm not uh, bastardizing too much, but, uh, you know, he talks about the hourly model where, you know, if people are paying by the hour, uh, basically if you're more experienced and you're a faster artist, you're getting paid less Mm. because you're getting the jobs done faster. And so to your client, you know, you, especially if you're close with them, you could have a very frank conversation and just say, you know, should I be getting paid less because I can get things done faster? And the long and short of it is no. Um, so at that point, that's when you can actually have a discussion and ask your client like, okay, well, you need to put yourself in their situation. There's, what is that equation? Like it, it can be cheap, it can be fast, it can be, um, Come on, Evan, help me out. Oh, the, the Cheap, you're, t- you're yeah, talking the about three. the triangle, right? Yeah, right, right, right. It can exactly. be it can two. be done yeah. low cost. So cost is the one end. Time, how quickly can it be done, is the other one, and then quality is the other one. So it's it's quality, time, and cost. Um, I I love this triangle idea. I like it for a lot of reasons. One because it's not a lot of people use it as an absolute, right? They say you can only have two out of the three, right? And that's one worldview, right? So imagine, imagine if you will, so that, that other humans can have other subjective worldviews. It's crazy. I know internet, (laughs) this, this one might blow your mind. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So if the goal, why am I taking out paper? I I usually draw this idea, but it's not going to be useful now. So we've got these three, we've got these three things and to we live in a capitalist society um crazy but we do most of us yeah most most of us us currently live under capitalism in which the client end the person buying the thing they want the best thing as cheaply as possible as quickly as possible they want to max those three bars right so for example it's not uncommon to hear a ceo or a coo someone whose job it is 
to game systems or to alter the playing field in some way to force this to go to to do this right now what that mentality betrays is that they believe the mechanism that does the labor is not <laughs> it doesn't need anything right they're thinking about it like a machine and you can have all three you can have it done with very little money with very high quality and very quickly if you are exploiting people <laughs> that's the big if right <laughs> if you are willing to cause human suffering you can make that happen right that's the hardest part to to get around um on the flip side on the flip side that if someone's coming at you with the mentality they want to max the bars then if you're going to play the same game, you want to minimize all the bars, right? If if it is a competitive capitalist system, and we're getting getting really off the rails here, but if someone if someone's worldview is I have to get all three of them maxed out, then to combat that, your worldview has to be I want to I want to do the lowest quality in the slowest amount of time and get paid a lot of money for it, <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be a dream? I do bad work. I it takes me months to do it, and they just pay an obscene amount of money. You know, so that is also possible if you're comfortable exploiting the other side, right? So when we talk about these, this triangle, I always say, you know, it is fair that we give two sides. It is fair to both that we do that. But if this is an RPG and you want to min-max your stats or however you're going to do it, you know, just remember that people aren't using, it's not an absolute, it's a lens, Right. So that's, yeah, that's my thought on, on, that's my spiel. You, you can, uh, you, this will probably be edited and thrown around the internet for a while. Maybe, hopefully not, but, um, not. that's, yeah. that's just my thought because I, I've seen like this debate on Twitter where people are saying, um, I actually have a way to get all three things. <laughs> and I'm like, right. But your Twitter, bi Twitter bio says that you're the C COO of a company. Your job is to juice humans for money. <laughs> so anyway let's uh yeah so uh just to so i'm glad you went into the two out of the three in yeah. terms of things but yeah. but basically what i was saying is if you could put yourself in your client's shoes when they're working on an individual project what's going to bring the most value to them because mm. they go to you because you're actually delivering value to them so if you can turn it around and say look I don't know if I can necessarily work on a second by second basis, but I could definitely work on this project basis. What do you say I get this project to you in five days and it costs X dollars? Like if you said five days for five grand or whatever it is, obviously that would be an, an excellent pay scale. Um, but they're looking at it as I get the job done and it's delivered to me in five days. Mm -hmm. And if five grand is within their wheelhouse, then that's great. You can yeah. go ahead and do that and, and you can rock it out. So I would probably try and see if you can angle it to be more of a per project basis. And uh, if you if you need to reference why um, you could talk about the 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 aspect that you're you're paying for time and each person's ability to deliver things based on time is different. Mm -hmm. So in the long run, even though they're delivering, um, even though they're paying by the second or by the frame, they're going to look at it. Well, of course you're going to work faster, but would you, would you, would they rather have you work faster and deliver a less quality work because you're working faster to deliver this based on whatever their dollar amount is, or would you rather be able to set in stone a flat dollar amount and guarantee a specific delivery amount? Yeah. Like, that's a really good argument in mm -hmm. terms of stuff. So that's kind of how I would come at it. Yeah. It, what about you, man? Oh man. It per second I find is always going to be uh, reductive, right? Because it, uh -huh. re it reduces whatever the thing is you're making to the product rather than the service. Right. And the, you have to remember you, we are performing a service. You're creating a bespoke object for this person you know, yeah. or company. It's interesting, the various pricing models, because I think Chris Doe has talked about this as well, that the utility of the object 
or the utility of the output also has value or that the context in which it will be used should also be considered, right? There are very there are so many pricing models and ideas and things floating around and who knows what's right for everybody. Probably there definitely isn't one thing that's right. I'll say that with my subjective client dealings, the clients I have the longest relationship with are the ones who are comfortable talking about money in frank, earnest terms, yep. right? If people are afraid to speak about money, it is often because they don't want to tip their hand. And well, if I tell them I have a budget of $5,000 and then they know, then they'll take all my $5,000, right? Right. You know, that, that's the fear, right? If I tell them the budget is this, they're going to take it all. And I want to get under my budget so that I get a bonus above, above you know, that thing. So most of the clients that I have the longest, healthiest relationship with, they can come to me and say, hey, you know, I don't, I don't have, we don't have a lot of money for this. What can we do, right? And then I can say, well, here, here, are, the, here are the corners we can cut to get you where you want to go with what you have. You know, that's a useful thing because it usually means, all right, we're going to take it back to our sales team and they're going to sell people on this lower concept idea that we can do. Because often it's these low budget things are, they don't require a lot of beauty. They aren't, they don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? We need to move some text around and, and push some images and display our third quarter earnings to the shareholders. You know, that's, it has to be marginally sexier than PowerPoint. Um, so it, it doesn't need a hot dog turning into a dog, turning into a baseball and flying off the screen, right? You don't need that because that's not, that's not what we have budget for. So the people I can speak to realistically about this, we have a longer tail relationship because neither of us are interested in exploiting the other. That's the, yeah. <laughs> that's the big, the big thing. Well, yeah. I, I really appreciate the fact that you actually brought out the exploitation factor because those are the things that a lot of people just um, don't really discuss when they're talking business because sometimes that, that, that puts things in a negative light most of the time. So, <laughs> well, you know, people don't, People don't necessarily like that, but I mean, this is the world we live in. So, you know, we have to be able to discuss different things like this. Yeah. Like we're, we're at a time in a climate where we're seeing so many more like union movements. We're, we're seeing, you know, a lot of discussions about labor. I come from uh, a very uh, left of center, even by Canadian standards household. Um, so it is a little bit weird that I'm maybe more of a capitalist uh, in my leanings. Right. But that's, uh, you know, the, wherever you fall on, on, on that spectrum of things, uh, I think is, is, is going to be personal and subjective. Um, and it, it requires a balance. I mean, the big thing is that we have to be humane to each other. I hope, I hope we're all feeling that way. Right. <laughs> you know, that's, and, and, you know, there are people in the world who are uh, short, short sighted, short game players right they're going to come in we're going to do this thing and they don't care where what the collateral is behind them or either consciously or unconsciously because some people just don't know some people are like uh oh, you know it just it just happens creative work just kind of happens right and people are yeah. ignorant and it happens well, yeah I, I didn't mean to interrupt but you inspired me to yeah. just kind of uh, discuss that uh whenever i'm dealing with any of my uh traditional clients where I'm doing motion graphics work for them. I, I honestly feel it's my job to educate them for whatever it is. Now, obviously clients that I've dealt with uh, for a very long time, we don't have to go through things like that, but clients that are new to whatever it is, uh, for example, uh, let's say it's like a, a small retail store that's family owned and they just want to create a video that they can promote on their social media. Like if I was coming in there and developing a script and doing a shot list and all this other stuff, it's my job to actually educate them as to the value that they are getting in right. whatever the production is so that they understand when we're actually going through it, uh, you know, what's coming out the other, the other side. So a big way to avoid any uh, miscommunication in the long run and actually add um, more zeros to the end of your check is to actually um, – you know, educate your client as to what the value is for whatever it is that you're en ending up creating. Yeah, it's really interesting, this idea of like a kind of a black box mentality, right? We're going to put a creative brief in and then something's going to come out. If you reveal right. more of what's happening in the process, if you involve people more in the process, 
it makes more sense why we're spending 40, 80 hours on this thing, right? If, if totally. people don't know, they don't see it. One of the things that I've found really interesting is kind of a trend in portfolios to show more of the process work that goes into beautiful pieces, we'll yep. say. I find that we really um, champion the product and we share it around and it's so immediate and it looks beautiful. But we don't champion the process that gets you there, right? All of the sketches that were thrown out, all the characters that didn't make it in, all of the boards and the iterations and the process that that got us there that tells bad the story. Renders. Yeah, all the bad renders, like <laughs> the the story of the piece, right? So when people are looking around and they think like, "Oh, what I want one of these," right? Because that's the <laughs> you know you get an email and it says, "Hey, can you do this? <laughs> can you give me right? one? I want one of those, please." Um, they are only looking at the final thing and saying, I want that. Can you make that now? And if they don't see, oh, there's more, there's a lot that goes into that. Whoa. You know, you know, that's missing. You know, that, that educational aspect is missing. And granted, we're not going to, we're not going to make everyone a beautiful person. We're not going to make everyone, you know, you know, humane and, uh, you know, highly interested in, in learning things. That's right. Yes. We're not, we're not going to solve those world's problems. Uh, Ian, nope. we're just, we were just here to solve some after effects problems and some cinema 4d problems. And, and, and yeah. now we're, we're flying off the rails, but I think, well, hold on. I actually did want to say one, one thing. Okay. Um, cause we both referenced Chris and yep. a lot of the stuff that he, that he's actually talked about. Mm -hmm. He, is in fact the keynote speaker at keyframes conference so um if that doesn't tip the tip the scales i i don't know what what does i'll be there kyle will be there yep. christo is going to be there so yeah i just wanted to put that out there as well especially in, if you want to actually see meet the guy it's yeah. in fabulous boston massachusetts um, that's it <laughs> what, what else what what date is that now that we now that we think about it, uh, it's the fifteenth through the seventeenth of okay. doo, 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 November. November, yeah. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, I think we'll we'll end the show there. I think this is probably a good place to to drop it. We're like twenty minutes over time here, so we we nice. really, we really beefed it. Um, <laughs> that's how much we respect your time, audience. We will go wildly over over schedule, but I want to above and beyond. Come on, that's true. We we medium promise and medium deliver. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much for coming out and spending the time with us. I know there's a there's a lot of things going on on a on a Friday afternoon or morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, I've been Evan Abrams. Uh, here on Motion Design Hotline. I want to thank everybody for bringing us their questions. And we're going to be doing this again next week. Kyle's going to be back in the chair. So he says, unless there is a horrifying accident and, uh, you know, he becomes trapped in Canada. And then uh, we might be coming to you from the same house. Um, so <laughs> it should be pretty, pretty, nice. wa pretty wacky. But yeah, thanks again, everyone, for coming out. Ian, thank you so much for uh, for spending the time with us here. Uh, Anytime, I, man. I really I'm appreciate it. And, you know, while, you're, uh, while we're here in this last few seconds is there any you know tell us where people can follow you on the social medias uh where people can follow creative 111 uh and just you know reiterate all those cool things yeah so uh in the lower right corner over here you can see my handle for instagram and twitter mm -hmm. at ian in motion uh so you can find me there uh on my twitter i'll definitely be talking more about motion graphics stuff and uh work stuff whereas my instagram is kind of like a stream of me trying to achieve balance between work and life so you'll see lots of landscapes and uh travel shots and different things like that um creative 111 uh if you're in if you're in youtube just search creative and then one spelled out and 11 spelled out and you'll find our channel please go there and uh, give us a subscribe uh, you can find us at creative111.com oh and then hmm. you are right there oh yeah sorry I stopped I stopped getting your audio for a minute hey re say, say that last sentence you said just in case no one heard it <laughs> okay yeah yeah so if you want to find the social media for creative 111 it's actually create 111 and that's on uh, Twitter and Instagram as well okay well I mean I, I saw the bars but I wasn't hearing it in my head so I have no ah, idea. okay anyway nice. yeah. right. and of course I'm Evan Abrams you're already on that channel so subscribe to this and turn on notifications if you want to see more of those I'm on Twitter at EC 
Abrams, you know, send us your questions, send us your troubles. I'm going to get back to actually making tutorials real soon on this channel. I totally promise. Uh, we, we do, we do. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're both going to get back to work. We promise. Uh, <laughs> thank, thanks also to our sponsor, uh, Milanote, for setting us up and, and hooking yeah. us up here. So, you know, big... Big thanks to them. And so, yeah, until next time, guys, keep keep coming at us with your questions, and we'll uh, see you on the Motion Design Hotline. Thanks again, and bye for now. And now I have to, have to turn our audios off. <laughs> and...